Thank you. My name is Carlo Piana. I'm a lawyer in Italy. Uh, I've been involved in uh, free and open source software matters since the early years of this century. Maybe some of you know me from uh, my work with the Free Software Foundation Europe and the European Legal Network and many other initiatives. I, have, I am founding partner of Array, an IT law firm dedicated to uh, information technology law and especially free and open source software licensing and compliance. Today, uh, we are presenting a case which we regard being the first GPL case in Italy hitting a courtroom. Uh, that is interesting because also it involves the a public administration distributing uh, infringing software. And this public administration, oddly enough, is the National Anti-Corruption Authority. It's a happy ending story, fortunately. We brought them to compliance. We agreed on compliance after nearly two years of discussions, though. Um, I'm going to be held by my friends and colleagues, uh, Fabio Pietrosanti, uh, president of Herman Center, the producer, the manufacturer of GlobalX, uh, is also the client, and my colleagues, Giovanni Battista Gallus and Alberto Pianon, both are partners of Array2. Uh, without any further ado, I will hand over to Fabio. Fabio, please introduce yourself, Herma Center and GlobalX. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, so uh, the Herma Center for Transparency and Digital Human Rights, it's uh, the NGO that in 2012 started up the GlobalX uh, uh, whistleblowing uh, software. That's a free software project working towards uh, the protection of whistleblower and that uh, uh, started just after the wikileaks collateral murder uh, fax as a way to find out uh, uh, how ngos journalists and uh, also public agencies and corporations can provide better protection to whistleblower uh, the software is a agpl license and it's being used by a variety of users uh, within uh, the different NGO and the journalistic sector, in particular within the anti-corruption NGO. And it's uh, in that context that uh, we started working uh, with uh, Transparency International, the uh, key NGO uh, existing in uh, more than 110 different countries, and with the anti-corruption bodies that uh, are public agencies uh, looking uh, at the fight of uh, corruption. In that sense, uh, we found ourselves in uh, reading a uh, cons public consultation by the Italian uh, National Anti-Corruption Authority while we were already working and supporting the Transparency International Italy chapter by improving the Global X free software in order to look at uh, that direction of anti-corruption activism. And we were very direct uh, in uh, answering the public consultation with our uh, insight and advice. This led us uh, to start uh, an informal cooperation that became a formal uh, cooperation without any economic basis, uh, entirely done uh, on a pro bono basis, uh, in developing a set of features that uh, was useful for ANAC, the Italian National Anti-Corruption Agency, and possibly for all the Italian public agencies that had to deploy a whistleblowing system in the fight of corruption, because in Italy the law requires uh, public agencies to provide a secure reporting channel for the fight of corruption. So we spent uh, months of uh, dedicated development and interaction with the anti-corruption agency, making improvement following uh, uh, needs that we spotted from uh, the underlying uh, uh, meeting that we had with them to understand how can we make GlobalX to further evolve in serving the anti-corruption uh, world, uh, not just in the NGO activistic sector, but also in the regulatory body uh, that look forward uh, the support of uh, public agencies and corporations. 
In that, Anak had a very good vision. They were very well prepared technician there. And uh, with uh, our CTO uh, and lead developer, Giovanni Pellerano, uh, we went undergoing uh, uh, more than uh, 20, 24 um, uh, different feature set and improvement to the software with iteration between uh, their manager and board and their uh, technician and different legal officers and achieved a set of uh, uh, functional release of the software. The code name of the software was open whistleblowing. And uh, interesting enough that uh, we heard informally that uh, someone inside the public agency, that a large and powerful uh, central public agency, didn't like the, the word leaks, part of global leaks, because uh, remembering WikiLeaks, and the internal decision was to use a code name open whistleblowing. Fair enough, we are working to make the world a better place to stay, so it's fine to have this kind of code name. Uh, so we worked with them until uh, we decided together, they decided that it was the time to publish the modification that we did to the software. Most of them uh, was uh, already uh, being committed upstream into the main global software, now being used by thousands and thousands of public agencies in the world, not just in Italy. Um, but some of them was, uh, you know, some hard patch that you put into the code. And this was uh, put, uploaded, committed uh, into the GitHub profile of ANAC slash anticorruzione on GitHub under the code name of Open Whistleblowing. And we did it. So what happened next? It happened next that, uh, mm, well, there was a tender to move it forward rather than developing in a community oriented way uh, and in a, with a, an iterative evolutionary approach to this software, like going iterative with a beta approach. Uh, and you know, public tender became very nasty and very complicated. Uh, and basically we found that uh, most of our pro bono work was uh, uh, ended in the hands of the winner of a very bureaucratic uh, public tender uh, where as an NGO, it's also quite difficult to provide the very safe, uh, the very same requirement. In the tender, it has been written to support uh, a deprecated version of uh, Microsoft SQL Server. So it was against our uh, uh, vision uh, also to uh, look at the direction of su supporting deprecated software into global leaks that are secure by default and very well open source component integrated piece of uh, uh, free technology and so in the end uh, what happened next uh, I mean uh, uh, Giovanni Battista Gallo can explain better than me thank you very much Fabio so uh, my role is to describe what happened and how we managed to obtain compliance with AGPL and uh, we leave to Carlo and Alberto the details of the most important legal issues so uh, as far as we know this is the first case of uh, first time that any GPL compliance case has been brought before an Italian court and one of the very first cases involving compliance uh, uh, from a public, uh, asked from a public administration. Uh, and so it, I think it's quite interesting, even if we uh, reach a settlement, so not a decision. Uh, so what happened? Uh, GlobalX, uh, which was developed as a prototype, was uploaded on GitHub in 2016 and together with the AGPL V3 license plus uh, the uh, reasonable legal notice uh, as we, under uh, Article 7b uh, powered by Global League, so additional terms under, under Article 7, 7b. And Hermes had an agreement with ANAC, the Italian Anti-Corruption Authority, as uh, uh, already pointed out, mentioned by Fabio. And uh, uh, so, uh, pursuant to this agreement, um, Anna, uh, Hermes gave ANAC control of the GitHub account and then de decided to issue a public uh, tender uh, for the development and maintenance of this uh, prototype and after uh, quite a while, in 2019, so a few uh, years after, they, uh, after they published in uh, the project repository a derived version which was called uh, Open Wisdom Blowing. And there were, however, several issues 
because the AGPL license was gone and it was replaced with a, a UPL, European Union Public License 1.2 and also the reasonable legal notice was remo removed there was only the uh, author's note and uh, some of the corresponding source uh, as defined in article 1 and 6 uh, of the license was not uh, completely available and uh, mm, also uh, open whistleblowing was adopted by several public administration and of course it was uh, adopted in the incompatibly licensed uh, flavor so to speak so what happened next uh, carlo piana our friends started writing to anax several times trying to keep his composure his known well-known composure to be as calm as possible and never asking for damages but only uh, to asking for compliance on behalf of the airmen centers and however uh, the answers of uh, anac were not uh, uh, so exactly uh, friendly and of course they stated they were uh, not infringing anything but uh, the compliance was not obtained because they uh, stated they were not in uh, uh, they were non uh, they were absolutely uh, respecting abiding uh, the license and the, uh, the change of license was uh, perfectly legal and so the violation was uh, ongoing and so Hermes could avail itself of uh, the clause uh, 8, artic the clause of article 8 of the AGPL so which provides for the uh, termination upon violation but also provides that if uh, uh, the uh, violator uh, cures the violation within 30 days of the notification then uh, the uh, license is permanently, reins permanently reinstated but in this case Anak in, our, in the pro uh, proposition of, uh, mm, of uh, uh, Hermes was still in, uh, uh, in breach did incur the violation so article 8 was clearly triggered and the termination was uh, uh, clearly triggered and uh, uh, Carlo uh, tried to uh, explain uh, this uh, also uh, once again uh, writing to uh, to Anak but they still stated they were uh, perfectly compli compliant however uh, after a certain time they published uh, a commit after uh, the uh, license was terminated uh, relicensing open whistleblowing as AGPL v, uh, v3 but there was still no compliance with regard to re the reasonable uh, legal notice and also with regard to the corresponding source however after a while after the proceeding uh, I will mention in a while uh, has started they also published part of the, the corresponding source especially of the client not in a, a minified version as they uh, as they did before uh, but uh, uh, of course uh, in the Hermes uh, position the, the license was already terminated and only uh, Hermes was uh, uh, only the copyright holder so Hermes uh, could uh, reinstate the license uh, so and at any rate still uh, there was no compliance on the other issues so uh, there was no alternative and uh, uh, Hermes started legal proceedings before the Tribunal of Milan. Carlo and Alberto will deal in depth with the issues of licensing compatibility, termination and minified code. I will keep just on telling the tale which is I think uh, very interesting. Hermes, uh, what, what did he do? He, what did he do? It asked for a preliminary injunction um, uh, under the Italian copyright law and the judge was asked to a certain the non-compliance and grant on an injunction on what term the injunction was to cease and desist for uh, any uh, uh, use accessible to the public or any publication of the derived work until uh, and uh, the condition imposed by a gpl v3 license and uh, with additional terms were met and also with the uh, subject to the reinstatement of the license by uh, by Hermes and it was asked, asked also 
for a penalty for every day of non-compliance. And it was also asked to uh, order ANAC to publish the court decision, not only in the uh, way provided by the Italian copyright law, but also in the web portal of the authority and in the GitHub repository, and also to notify the decision to all public administration which uh, asks for reuse of the derivative work. And in this case, uh, in the legal proceeding, the authority, unsurprisingly enough, denied to be non-compliant and strongly stated that relicensing under the UPL was perfectly legal. It also stated that the additional terms were not applicable and the uh, corresponding source obligation were met. And I, as I already stated, the corresponding source was published, but after uh, the proceeding were, uh, were started. And it is very interesting to point out that there was no objection or even any discussion or about the legal validity or the binding nature of the AGPL provisions. So uh, it was just a matter of the interpretation of this uh, provision and if there was compliance or not. It seemed that the, the parties were very, uh, really, a world apart, but then uh, Carlo uh, may, had a trick up his sleeve and uh, he uh, made a settlement proposal that uh, they absolutely couldn't refuse. And so, to put it briefly, and not exactly in legalese, he's proposed, okay, you get the license right, you, pub you publish the corresponding source, just go one step further, add the additional terms and we will reinstate the license and everybody, uh, everybody will be happy at the end. And at this point, after some back and forth uh, also uh, before the judge in, in Milan, the authority agreed and uh, the settlement was done out of court and we issued the uh, Hermes and the authority issued a joint press release and so really everybody was happy. So what is the most important uh, lesson to be learned? Well, uh, I leave it to Carlo and Alberto uh, to, sum it, to sum it up and uh, I, thank you, uh, I thank you all uh, and I hope to see you uh, soon in the very next future. Thank you Giovanni. Lesson learned. The first lesson I personally learned from this uh, ordeal is that we lack education. We must produce better information, more accessible information, and we spare, we have to spare no effort to bring ordinary people to sufficient level of knowledge. We have won the battle of having free software mainstream, dominant in certain places, but that has not been followed by sufficient degree of education. And we have learned it the, the hard way here, because we approached the, the, uh, the authority and they said, no, we are not infringing uh, any of your copyright. We insist of explaining, uh, making reference to documents and say, oh, look, you might know that this is open source now, it's, uh, it's copyleft, meaning that, um, there are no conditions for reusing the software, which is uh, strikingly the opposite of what uh, we learned and something we have not heard uh, in the last 20 years, perhaps. So um, going forward and trying to explain again my position as a somewhat expert of this matter, writing books, uh, writing articles, being an editor of a review, general counsel to the Hope Foundation, teaching things at the university, a master course and a university degree. Uh, they came up with something more uh, elaborate like, oh, EUPL is compatible with the AGPL because there is a blog telling that. <coughs> Excuse me. Actually, there was a <coughs> A block reporting that a, a UPL is compatible, but without mentioning in which direction. So inbound, outbound, both no explanation. Actually, in the uh, official documentation of the UPL, that is quite well explained how to combine UPL code with AGPL. But uh, there was an English and possibly behind 
a linguistic barrier. So um, that is um, uh, the lack of easily consumable, maybe translated, uh, documentation of the basic concept that we are teaching and we have practice in, in any day in a compliance exercise, it's important. And indeed, in any compliance effort we are making, uh, we are offering a basic uh, crash course, 101 course on IP, software, uh, copyright, and, and, and copyleft concepts, so that we have a basic understanding even for uh, technical people. And actually, this uh, dev room, the legal dev room in a technical and community uh, event as Fosden goes in the right direction. And I praise uh, those bringing uh, the idea of in, uh, a legal dev room. Second lesson, there is a still misconception on what source code is. Um, we said, you're not distributing the source code of the interface. And I said, no, it's, look, there's this source code. You can read it, no, it's the source code. And uh, well, that is a misconception derived uh, for, from a lack of knowledge of what minification is. The file was minified, and I will leave to my colleague, Alberto, who is going to dig deeper in this aspect. Alberto, please have uh, your, uh, your presentation. Thank you very much, Carlo, and hello, everyone. I appreciate that most of you may be already familiar with the concept of JavaScript minification. So please forgive me in advance if some parts will sound commonplace to some of you. It's just to get also non-technical audience to understand. So basically, our claim about the JavaScript part of open whistleblowing was based on the fact that, unlike the original repository, source code offered for download by the defendant was the JavaScript front-end of open whistleblowing, like serve, minified in some parts, everything concatenating in, into a single huge file. The defendant contended that this was still a source code distribution and that it was compliant with the AGPR requirements. Obviously, we claimed that this was not the case. How the notion of source code used by the defendant compare with the legal definition of a source code provided by the AGPL? Well, AGPL, as we all know, defines it as the preferred form for making modifications to the code itself. Following this definition, a single huge minified JavaScript file cannot be regarded as source code. Why? Well, the first fundamental notion here is that JavaScript is an interpreted programming language. Interpreted means that JavaScript doesn't need to be previously translated into machine language in order to be executed, but as the word says, it is translated into machine language by the computer equivalent of a real-time interpreter and immediately executed by the machine itself. This is indeed very different from the distinction between object versus source code in compiled programming languages like C, Java, and others, where human readable source code needs to be previously compiled and therefore translated into the machine language in order to be understood and actually executed by the machine itself. As we all know, with compiled languages, a software program may be distributed in two different forms, source code form or machine core form. The latter may be also called, depending on the context, object code or executable code. On the other hand, technically speaking, with interpreted languages, we normally distribute only source code. There is no such thing as object code distribution in interpreted languages. And this is the case also of JavaScript. Well, actually, some modern JavaScript interpreters do compile code before executing it. But such compilation is intended just for browser-specific internal use and not for distribution, so the conclusion doesn't change. Summing up, technically speaking, the defender was right. Whatever you do with JavaScript, you always end up with source code. It's materially impossible to distribute JavaScript object code because it simply does not exist in that form. But does this hold also in the legal field? To answer, we need to make a step forward. While JavaScript cannot be distributed in compiled form, it can be minified. What does that mean? I will make you the same example that we made to the judge at the trial hearing. What you see on the screen now is a simple code snippet written in JavaScript. 
It's a simple function that returns user data given their ID number. What this code does is straightforward to anyone who reads it because the function and variable names just tell it. Get user data, user ID, get user, and so on. It's almost like plain English, and if there's any doubt left, the comment that you see in the code clarifies it. But let's assume that this code, for some reason, is too long and takes too much to download and execute. Since function and variable names are arbitrary, we can just substitute them with uh, single letters. And since comments are not executed and are simply ignored by the machine, we can just strip them out. The result may look more or less like what are, uh, you are seeing now on the screen. So, this essentially is what minified uh, JavaScript is all about. To save space and to speed up code download, comments and white space are stripped out and function and variable names are replaced with random letters, so the code gets much shorter and lighter to download. The problem is that now the code looks totally incomprehensible. For a machine, the two codes are functionally equivalent. But for a human, the first one is something that one can understand and possibly modify. But the second one is something that could be understood and modified just in theory, but in practice it would be as difficult as solving a very complicated puzzle. Most software developers wouldn't even try. So is that still source code? Technically speaking, yes, since it still needs to be interpreted in order to be executed on a machine. Is that object code? Technically speaking, no, since there is no such thing as object code in JavaScript. But legally speaking, things are different. All GPL licenses, namely GPL, AGPL, LGPL, at section one, provide that, I quote, the source code for a work means the preferred form for the work for making modifications to it. Object code means any non-source form of a work. So given these definitions, the answers to the above questions completely change. Is JavaScript minified code still source code in GPL and AGPL parlance? No, because it's definitely not the preferred form for making modifications. Is that object code? Yes, because it does not fall into the above definition of source code. So, the final question is, am I violating the GPL if I distribute GPL JavaScript code only in minified form and I do not even offer to provide uh, the original non-minified code? Yes, I'm violating it because I'm not complying with the obligation to provide the full source code. It's just as simple as that, but it's something that is often overlooked by developers and not only in this specific case. The distribution of JavaScript code in only minified form is something that we often see in our open source compliance practice. But when the license GPL, this is simply something that one is not allowed to do. And this is so, not only because it was our defense in this case, but because it is a clear-cut statement of the GPL that cannot be subject to different interpretations and probably will hold true also for other licenses that do not expressly define source code. Actually, in our case, also the defendant had to admit that in the end, and we finally obtained the true source code of open whistleblowing front end, no minified, divided in smaller source files. Now, just let me pass you back to Carlo on the conclusion of the case, and thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you, Alberto. That was really informative. And the final point I want to touch upon briefly is on the additional conditions um, that GlobalX has attached to the AGPL. So, the AGPL was not vanilla. We want the authority to restore the AGPL, despite uh, that it was terminated, but that is, is another story. Um, they used the exact uh, version taken from the Free Software Foundation website. Uh, here, there was a contention by, uh, by the state of, uh, attorney, not on the fact that the actual the actual disclaimer that we wanted to 
to put a reasonable notice that it was wanted to have to restore was or not complying with Section 7B of the AGPL. But um, they contended that um, the version they have forked from did not contain the uh, mention that we uh, required. Actually, we were lacking because um, on the one hand, we kept a copy of the repository that they have forked. Actually, they didn't. They haven't forked the, the, the repository. They took the code and put into a single large commit um, in, uh, with everything already done. But we had the original version with the commit history. And on the top of that, uh, we have been able, and there was no chance to, to show because we had a settlement, but we were able to trace the history of the repository and the dates when the repository was added because, well, uh, Software Heritage had made a, a snapshot of that repository and we were able to retrieve it from the um, from a third party, a reliable third party. But this is also a, a, a problem that we would have faced in case we hadn't been able to just prove the timeline. Of course, the law uh, and the Git repository have a date, but there is no uh, date stamp. There's no date stamp. So there it's difficult to prove that a certain modification occurred at a certain time. Of course, you can trace the history, but the history can be altered. There are many articles out there and suggestions as to how to prove how a project evolved. Of course, if the project is public, you have many witnesses and people copying uh, the same, uh, um, cloning the same repository over and over, but actually having one single true um, and uh, source of authority as to the timeline, that is also a, a good idea, especially in case you decide to uh, switch to another li uh, another license as in practice globally leak like that so uh, it was a long uh, story perhaps uh, the case was lucky enough to to be brought to uh, an happy end as I said uh, through a settlement uh, what ends good is good um, eventually we had a very good relationship with the authority after we show that we were not there for money or for prestige and they st stuck to the agreement to the letter it was a costly exercise in terms of time my personal time albertus john battista and other other people like marco ciucina i want to mention him he was not in the case but he was uh, uh, helpful trying to establish connection and to um, relay the right messages to the right people and also costly on uh, a monetary side my time was partly pro bono Giovanni Battista and Alberto and Tad pro bono and uh, there was kind of cost connected to, to the litigation but at the end of the day it's possible to go after even a big guys for a small project uh, like a, a state actually or a branch of the state, uh, so to speak, and win and bring home uh, a good result. So I want to thank, thank you for your attention. I want to thank um, Frozen organizer and the dev room organizer for having us. It was uh, the first time we could uh, speak publicly uh, about, about this topic. And um, thank you to my co-host, Alberto, Fabio and Giovanni Battista. We remain available for any further um, uh, uh, queries, questions, curiosity. We are, are sticking here for, for some minutes longer. Please don't hesitate. Meanwhile, see you next time. Bye. Cheers.
So one of you has the audio still going, please mute it. All right, thank you so much for uh, for doing that um, that summary and that presentation. I think that was a real, um, uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, really useful to the audience. We had some great Nobody questions coming in. Uh, somebody on this panel needs to mute their audio um, from the broadcast room. Um, but uh, okay, so the first question, do you all represent, are you all the legal team that worked on this? Is that all of you? Oh, that, that's a good question. Uh, actually, I made a, 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 a some some obscure comment or question on, on the chat. Actually, we completely forgot to mention that there there was uh, there was a lady, a lawyer, very fine lawyer, helping us with the unfortunately the leg work without the the spotlight on. But she was very uh, um, uh, very helpful, and uh, she has done yeah, the actual uh, filings and, and stuff. So I forgot to mention her. And I wanted to give her credit. She was on the records as, as a lawyer, and uh, she is also an IT lawyer. And so I, I wanted to mention her too. Uh, but and and Marco Marco Chutina, uh wasn't on, on the records, but it has uh, is is with uh, is a, um, a fellow of Herm Center. And he's also been um, has, has given uh, suggestions. Uh, um, it was considerate. Uh, it was uh, suggesting to to be um, to suggesting us to be uh, quite patient. Then everything will be uh, good at the end. So we have a bunch of um, of good questions that the audience uh, uh, came in with. Uh, the first one that I'm just going to go by how they are upvoted since they're um, uh, that way the audience has a chance to weigh in on what's asked. So the top question is uh, is from Bikun and it was, uh, do the speakers think that the AGPLV3 section 5A require disclosure of the commit history, for example, the Git repository? Uh, this is not the first time this question has been asked in this context. I don't think so. I think that could be helpful, and it's a way to show this. But consider if uh, the same source code or, or, or circulated as a tar tarball, and there is no way to uh, uh, using this as the way to uh, make the comments and make the, the notice would mean that everybody would have to also do the same. Uh, that would be quite cumbersome. Um, uh, instead, I think uh, the notices should go in the source code now, aside uh, uh, or com uh, complementing the distribution of the source code, because that could be easily stupid out, uh, even involuntarily. Conversely, if you make the notices in the source code, you make sure that everybody would just have to, to, to download the source code and, and redistribute it and to upload it, not necessarily on the same. Uh, or, uh, or a fork or, or, or a clone of the same repository. Mm. Yes, if I may add something on this uh, also, uh, the, um, uh, the thing is that uh, uh, legally you are required to, to state your copyright, but not always uh, the, the authors of the commits uh, are the, the copyright holders. If they work for a corporation, uh, the copyright is owned by, by the, the, the company. So it's not exactly the same, the same uh, information. Does anybody else want to add anything? Okay, so the next question is, if you could all change the definition of source code in AGPLv3, what would you do? Or do you think the current definition is perfect? I cannot see any major flaws. I think defining it uh, by its purpose is the best thing. Because as, as long as you go down in redefining, better defining it, I think you will risk to leave something obvious outside and not coping up with uh, uh, evolution. Of course. Um, that was made with C-like uh, languages. 
uh, and not in, in interpreted languages. But uh, I, I think it's it's still quite uh, a good one, at least if you are conversing with the technology with software development. The problem we, we had here is that um, there was some bad faith on somebody and some misunderstanding on, on other people, uh, not knowing that being able to read somehow the code wasn't the requirement. But having the, the, um, if they had looked at the requirement of the AGBL, that would have been much more uh, simpler, simple and uh, straightforward, I think. I, I just wanted to add uh, just a little comment to say that uh, this also the case and also what Alberto stated uh, is, a, is a testimony that uh, this definition is uh, a, very, a, very, a very short one. It's, uh, it's very good also because uh, cl clearly states what source code is and especially uh, states what that the non-source code is the object code. So this kind of definition doesn't leave any room for any a different interpretation, which may confuse in uh, when it comes uh, to uh, languages as JavaScript. Um. Somebody, and that, that's not related to this, but somebody has uh, already pointed out that I still forgot to mention this lady uh, lawyer helping us. Is, uh, her name is Elisabetta Fabio. So uh, it's, it's not the same. Uh, Fabio is, uh, is the family name. It's not, uh, not like um, Fabio Petrosanti is the first name. But she's, uh, again, Elisabetta Fabio. She used to work with me, and uh, she will still cooperate. Does anybody want to add anything to the about the definition in AGPL v3? All right. So, um, uh, is there some place that we can read all about this? Are you going to do a, a blog post where you talk about the whole um, story in details? I think the uh, Herpa Center has some of the story, at least uh, until we start to exchange legal documents. Uh, we, yeah. sorry, we consider uh, to um, discuss it more in, uh, in a better uh, detail, what happened. Of course, we cannot exchange, uh, we cannot reveal the actual uh, communication. Neither are we allowed to share the actual documents. In case it ended with a public uh, decision, that would have been public, but the, the, the other documents are not public and cannot be disclosed. And um, with with that, having time and, and, and finding the good key, um, it, it would be a good idea for us to, to, to say something about it. And having this uh, this presentation is the best uh, is uh, the the closest thing we, we could think of without writing something. Uh, I think that it would be a very interesting exercise to uh, publish uh, a joint uh, um, a joint handout of the case with uh, anti-corruption authority, also in order to foster the compliance and in order to avoid uh, similar mistakes in the future. They would be uh, very, very interesting also in the spirit of collaboration with the uh, public authorities. I don't know if uh, Fabio wants to add something on it. Yeah, so uh, as uh, uh, all uh, the friends that uh, in this talk uh, that we did the journey with uh, within uh, this uh, AGPL litigation, my personal uh, activistic soul uh, were always uh, kicking uh, to push publicly and transparency and transparently any kind of document that we were exchanging with the authority counterpart because a uh, non-software expert answer can be uh, can make you smile a lot um, but I understand that uh, for a greater good, it was uh, best uh, to find an arrangement. And in such a case, 
I would like to say that uh, our activistic uh, spirit, uh, that's also about embarrassing a public agency when it's worthwhile, was uh, put uh, to a, a narrow level for the true greater good achievement. The first one was that we are aligned with the social purpose of anti-corruption authority in the fight of corruption. So we are allies, we are not enemy. And that was a mistake because of a lack of knowledge related to software copyright and the specific aspects of open source software licenses. And the second, it's also about the fact that uh, in Italy, we have uh, a very decent law on uh, use and that uh, public code, public money, concept, uh, it's by law applied in Italy, but is not yet being applied every day by public agencies. And uh, uh, so creating a lot of noise about uh, uh, an error, a mistake uh, by a central public agency in doing something good. That's about publishing the modification of a free software. Uh, would that be counterproductive in our common uh, action in uh, making public agencies push their software uh, with free license. So uh, that I wanted to underline that uh, because uh, we realized that the case uh, has been uh, big and there was also a big opportunity to make a lot of noise, but we decided to work under the line to achieve uh, such a greater good. So my, um, I, I'm curious about whether the rules are the same as in Germany. Oh, I see Bradley is asking the same question. Um, uh, but from our experience, sort of from what, what I, I know a little bit about Germany because of the VMware case. Um, so I was wondering, is it the, is it the laws that require um, the filings to be private? Is that like, is that a, a, you know, mandated that any of the filings be non-published? until there's a final decision? And then once it's, there's a final decision, can you publish all the documents? No, no, actually you can, you're not supposed to be publishing uh, also the, uh, the documents. Sometimes that would be interesting too, um, in, in general terms, I mean, uh, especially the final pleadings where you sum up all the case and make all, all the, the, the most thorough explanation of your case and stuff, but that's not, uh, uh, it's not really in the law. There is a general understanding and by bar rules and data protection uh, also, uh, that is uh, something that you, you're, you're not supposed to do. Uh, only the decision, um, which uh, in turn will bring much of the information required uh, or, and, and the interesting stuff, because the judge is uh, somewhat uh, in a position to be reporting correctly the position of the parties. But apart from that, um, there is no transparency at all uh, for everything that has, has, has gone through the, uh, the case. Actually, uh, I'm working for a legal publisher and uh, they will be keen on also publishing um, the, the final things because sometimes they are very well written by very high level uh, lawyers, even the Supreme Court. You know, they are not uh, available to anybody at all levels, even including uh, um, uh, Supreme Court. That's a pity. Yeah, and yes, yes. also, sorry, and also in this case, uh, there was only a request for a preliminary injunction, so there was no final decision, which would have been published. Uh, uh, the, the final decision would be uh, made, it would have been published not for the preliminary injunction, but uh, for the final judgment if it ever uh, would have uh, ended without without the settlement so uh, in this case uh, everything is quite uh, was quite private and will be like that so the next question is uh, from someone with the handle of Donix and the question is how do you afford to take this pro bono and and how long did it take? I mean, uh, 
it's it's it's, it's, it's it has not been so expensive. I mean, in terms of time, it was quite expensive, and it, it required a lot of hours to train. But eventually, uh, it's, it's something we all do um, as a part of our uh, contribution back to society for making a decently good uh, return on our profession. Um, it took. Um, in in, in uh, the time span between we started and until we reached an settlement was more than 18 months. Uh, it was like 10 months before actually deciding to uh, to go to court, 20 to 12 months. And then, uh, unfortunately, COVID uh, was, <laughs> uh, we were supposed to have a hearing on March uh, 2020. Uh, but that goes adjourned uh, by three months because everything was shut down, and uh, uh, that was really awkward also to to, to discuss because uh, we couldn't go to court. We had to do uh, remotely, and the judge wasn't uh, uh, available to have any live discussion. We were supposed to to having a very short uh, discussion. Only we we, we could we, that that's quite interesting because we uh, have not be. Uh, we have not been uh, uh, allowed to um, to file a full uh, rebuttal to, um, to, to, to to the reply of the, the other party. So we were just supposed to say, state your case on what you want, and, and that's it. And that was the, 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 the coup de théâtre. We, we had to say, okay, we propose to, to end this uh, via a... a, a Seven, because um, we uh, we were close, of course, and uh, there, there was no chance to re uh, reply in very detail. In terms of hours, uh, frankly, I didn't take any account of it because uh, I would be perhaps in the 80, 100, I don't know. So the next question is, uh, do courts generally, this is from Max Mel, do courts generally accept software heritage as a source for evidence? Oh, generally it's, uh, <laughs> I cannot state it because uh, uh, it, have, it never happened to me to, to, to be forced to that. But uh, sometimes I have filed like, uh, um, other other sources, so it, it, it's not legally uh, valid. I mean, it's not binding, but the judge can take any source of evidence as an evidence. So the rule is that the uh, um, free, unfettered uh, decision of the judge. So that's that. There is no formal rule for what is evidence, what is not. I mean, there are. There are rules, but uh, um, on, on, uh, on, on witness evidence, there are rules on um, what is legal evidence, but in general, everything, everything can be evidence. If it comes from a third party, like a newspaper, like a, a log, or somebody who does that and it's not related to you, it's even more um, valid, effective, and convincing. That's, that's the key to be convincing and not related to one of the parties. So um, were there, this is another question we had in the channel, were there any discussions of installation issues in the discussion with the violator? Mm, no. I don't think so. What, 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 what can be the angle here? Maybe, maybe Carlo, it's about referring to uh, the installation scripts or the packaging scripts. Because if you remember, we had also some support files that were uh, not present. That's possibly one of the one of the items related to installation, but uh, uh, it's worth saying that uh, the open whistleblowing, uh, the name of the fork with this uh, AGPL violation, um, 
was uh, packaged for use uh, with the uh, uh, Red Hat system, with the uh, RPM packaging, and uh, while GlobalX is made up for Deb packaging with uh, under Debian and uh, Ubuntu and so on. Uh, and what we found out is that the packaging scripts was missing. Um, maybe that will be that will be one option related to the installation. Uh, it's worth saying that uh, five days after the anti-corruption authority released the uh, the AGPL infringing version of their software and made a public announcement, so that organizations such as Bank of Italy started deploying it. So, I mean, spreading the violation itself. We released a 15-page technical document saying which were the technical issues and the technical consideration among the two edition of the software uh, without any, let me say, comments on quality, but uh, based on uh, technical factual analysis in order to let the technical community make also their own evaluation uh, because we had the moment and it's currently the same situation, but now everything has been cleared. Uh, that there were those two software, the one recommended by the Anti-Corruption Authority and the one based on uh, glo the, the GlobalX one made by the Hermes Center that was three years ahead in development. So a public agency, which of the two software had to choose? And that was a problem, let me say, of a narrative of installation. And what we did is to produce technical documentation to let people evaluate and judge on a technical basis. So here's another question um, from an audience member named Borger. Um, and the question is, uh, the license states that the original source code must be supplied when asked, but are there any rules, and I would say with an Italian focus, um, to how it should be provided? Public repository on GitHub may seem obvious, but could it also be provided printed on paper, for example? Uh Okay, in, in our case, there was no question on how, because everything was provided actually in, in everything which was provided was provided on the GitHub uh, uh, repository. Uh, there were part missing, but there was no question of uh, unwillingness to, to, uh, um, to supply the, so the complete source so code. Um, they fell short of their obligation and they provided something different, but no question about it. In paper, uh, that we that would be quite impractical, and 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 that would not, I mean, in my understanding, meet the requirement of the preferred form. The preferred form is a file that you can modify, not something that you have to scan and uh, or, or otherwise. But uh, if it's a hello word, perhaps, but anything more than that, I would not say that is the preferred word way to uh, to modify. And by modifying, mean uh, modify with other people, uh, exchange with other people. I, I think it's uh, it's an interesting question, but uh, the answer is definitely no. Well, uh, if I may just add that uh, in this case, uh, we are speaking about uh, AGPL. So it means that uh, anyone interacting through a network with a software application must be able to obtain a copy of the source code and the license. So that means being it ma being made it uh, publicly reachable by who can interact uh, over the network with the software that implicitly say put it digitally somewhere online so i've got another question i'm going to ask but before i do that i want to thank the panelists for joining us and i'm going to ask the question and we're going to move over to um uh, to the private room and anyone who wants to join, it's becoming public. And so anyone can join and continue this conversation. So thank you so much.